Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Isn't it great to be here? Amen. It is so good to be here, folks. It is so good to see everyone this morning. If you're visiting with us this morning, we want you to know how very welcome you are. We are thrilled that you've come and, and added your prayers and your heart to our worship. Uh, and we want you to know that, I mean, join us, be with us and love us. We want to love you because whoever you are and wherever you've been and whatever you've done, no matter what's happened to you, no matter what you think about yourself, and no matter what other people think about you, you are welcome here. You are wanted here. Because we serve a God who loves all of his creation and wants to see none of it destroyed. He cares for all of us. He loves all of us. And he invites all of us to come to Jesus Christ. He wants everyone to know Jesus. So no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, it's no estrangement from God's love. And God is able to heal the most broken of us. Able to rescue the most hurting. So wherever you've been, whatever you've done, welcome to church. This morning I'd like to begin with a reading from the scripture in uh, the word of God in the book of Deuteronomy. Moses writes in chapter 7. When the Lord your God brings you into the land that you are entering to take possession of it and clears away the many nations before you. And then it's a long list of strange names. Uh, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the, etc. Seven nations more numerous and mightier than you. And when the Lord your God gives them over to you and you defeat them, then you must devote them to complete destruction. You shall make no covenant with them and show no mercy to them. You shall not intermarry with them, giving your daughters to their sons or taking their daughters for your sons. Or they would turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. And then the anger of the Lord would be kindled against you. And he would destroy you quickly. But thus you shall deal with them. You shall break down their altars and dash in pieces their pillars and chop down their ashram and burn their carved images with fire. It's a happy text. Uh, I'll get to that in a second. When I first moved here, uh, one of the very first things that my family did was to have dinner with Mike and Carrie Walls. Many of us remember Mike Walls. If you've ever eaten with the Walls family, you know that Mike will bring out hot sauce. And no, that's not right. Mike will bring out liquid fire and distilled scorpion venom and pour it on your face. Uh, when I first moved here, I liked hot stuff, I enjoyed it, but I was sane, I was not stupid, you know, and Mike, frankly, was stupid. Uh, he, he enjoyed hot sauces that were in the somewhere like 6 million Scoville unit range, which is like, that's roughly like, you go to the sun to cool down when you have that. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. So, you know, but, man, I wasn't going to let him know that it hurt. So I, you know, I took that stuff and... Yeah, it, it hurt. Yeah, I didn't like it much at all. That was in 2013. In August of 2017, you may recall an eclipse that happened in this area. Do you remember that? Yeah. Yeah. On the day of the eclipse, I had a teenager challenge me with a Carolina Reaper. <laughs> and once again, I was not going to let him know that, okay, I'm kidding, that I, I lost all my cool, but I ate the Carolina Reaper, I did, I did, and I kept it in my body, which filled me with pain and regret, it was really awful, but the interesting thing is that I, if you've ever had a Carolina Reaper, why did you do that? <laughs> it's a really an awful experience, but uh, here's the thing. I can drink Tabasco sauce like Kool-Aid now. I can't feel heat until it reaches a certain point. I can eat a jalapeno like an apple. You know, the, the inside of my mouth has changed. It used to be that if I ate a habanero, you know, I mean, that'd be it for the day. I would be done for the day. But after you've had that, 
just about everything kind of seems kind of wimpy, to be honest with you. I mean, once you've been to another dimension, everything in this one is rather bland, you know? Because we change. That's our nature. I don't think that I am capable of going back to life as it was before the Carolina Reaper. I don't think that I can re-experience hot sauce the way that I used to. You know, I mean, I, I regularly put hot sauce into stuff I drink now. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I know, I know. I didn't say I was sane, and I didn't say the change was an improvement. I said, I said that we change. It is in our nature to change. It's what we are. Human beings are, the theologians have a word called mutability or another one called passability. But both of them just mean changeable, able to be altered in nature. We like to think that we're not. If I change, it's because I changed my mind. I changed my thinking. You know, I decided to change and then I changed. But we don't change because, oops, you know, nothing can change me unless I choose to change myself. But is that what we're like? Is that our nature? In the scripture that we read this morning, this unhappy scripture where he calls for the destruction of seven different nations, it's, it's pretty dreadful. But why is God doing that? Well, I mean, in terms of God's mission, God is concerned that there be a people into whom the Messiah can come. He's concerned with the redemption of all nations. And so the people that live here, I mean, originally his plan was to drive them out with wasps and hornets and drive them out. So they were going to go into exile, not be exterminated. But when the people refused to take the land, that plan goes off the table. You can see that in, in the book of Exodus. But here he's calling for their elimination. Why on earth? That's such a high cost. Well, why do that? Well, he says there in verse 4, they would turn away your sons from following me. Mutability. Changeability. God is looking at his people, at all people really everywhere, and he's saying... The reality is that we are surrounded by forces. We are surrounded by value systems. We are surrounded by belief systems. We are surrounded by cultures that do not share the beliefs and the knowledge of God. That do not originate in God, but in sin. Granted, every culture that you'll go to anywhere is made up by people and people are created in the image of God. And so every human culture has got something in it that's beautiful. I bet you the, the Parasites or the Gergeshites or the whatever. Uh, I guarantee you they had things about them that were beautiful. Because there are people. And people are bearing the image of God. But people are also fallen into sin. And because we are, everything is broken. Every human culture, it doesn't, the one you live in right now is broken and it is changing constantly. Huh. Let me give you a for instance, one that's kind of on a lot of people's minds right now. If you were to go in and somehow poll, give everyone in America truth serum so that they had to tell the pollster the truth. You know, because they, they don't. But they, you had to tell the pollster that. And then you pulled every single American citizen. And you asked them, what do you think? Should schools be segregated by race? Like compelled segregation? Well, if you did that across the whole nation today, you would get a minority that would say, yeah. And there are white supremacists in this country. You know, that would say yes. And there would be people who would say, well, if the minorities want their own space, then yes, we ought to let them have it. You know, so you would have segregation, segregationists on the right and the left, but they would be in the major minority, wouldn't they? Like the massive minority. For the most of us, aren't you a little troubled that I'm even talking about it? 
It's going like, I don't like this. Okay, now get into, you know, Peabody and Sherman's Wayback Machine. You know, borrow the DeLorean, get it up to 80 years. Go back 80 years. Do that exact same thought experiment. Exactly the same. Give everybody truth serum and ask them the question. What do you think the numbers would be like? Public opinion on this issue has changed, hasn't it? I think really significantly changed. Like embarrassingly changed. But if you were back in, say, 1920, and you were to ask this question, it would seem just as ridiculous to them as it would to us, but for different reasons. And they would say, well, justice demands what we are doing. Huh. Or let me give you a more contemporary one. How many genders are there? <laughs> Do you like that question? I'm a little concerned because I want to post this on YouTube. And even bringing up the matter in today's culture, it's, this is an untouchable. You're not supposed to say this because obviously there are as many genders as there are human opinions about themselves. Gender has to do with their identity, and we all shape our own identity. Gender is not the same as sex. I mean, come on. Now, if you don't believe that, that's because of your religion, not because of your culture. But if you get in the Wayback Machine, how far back do you have to go before that's insane? And not very far, right? Like 12, maybe 15 years. And, and suddenly, that, it's not that that idea is brand new. It existed, but it existed in the halls of the academies. But now, it's the mainstream. It's all over the place. That change happened fast. I mean, that, that change really began with pressure in, what, 2010? We're talking a decade. And folks, these are significant things. The definition of justice, the definition of anthropology and the nature of human beings. What is gender and sex? Those are big deals. Or how about morality? What is morality? Well, how dare I even bring it up, right? I mean, morality is an entirely personal thing. It's an entirely personal decision. Do you realize that insanity is new? And if you go back and you read philosophers for the last 1,500 years, then what are they discussing? Morality. That's what they talk about. And yet now it's just, it's an untouchable. Don't you legislate your morality in me. By the way, if, uh, if you wear a mask and glasses together, you may be uh, eligible for condensation. That's so funny. That's so now, how is that going on? Well, the truth is that's human nature. Human beings are mutable. We change, and we change about significant things, and we change all the time. What God is saying in this dreadful thing, and why would he put such a high cost? The lives of all of these people, why? Because God knows good and well how hard it is to genuinely be a human being shaped after the image of God in this world. We are surrounded by forces and belief systems and opinions that are not of the gospel. And folks, they are putting pressure on us all the time and they are attractive like the beautiful daughters of these these parasites and the beautiful sons of these gergeshites there is reason he's telling them don't marry them don't do that i know they've got wealth but don't you inherit it into your family don't go those ways because they will distort you and they will break you and they will change you because you are changeable but hear the word of the Lord from the prophet Malachi in the third chapter he says I the Lord do not change 
Therefore you, O son of Jacob, are not consumed. You see, we have to come to terms with the reality that there is all around us in all times and in all places a constantly changing and sinful humanity that will consume our souls if we intermarry with them with our minds. The threat isn't so much about genetic intermarrying anymore. The Christ has come. The threat now, the threat now is that we should be shaped by things that are not of Jesus Christ. There are messages that we are hearing every day. Hate your enemy. Hate them. Is that the gospel? Despise those who are different. If they disagree with you, they are alien. Hate them. That's a huge message in our culture today. Jesus says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Are you doing it, church? I, the Lord... Do not change. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's the book of Hebrews. Also in the book of Hebrews, there's a, a statement about Jesus that says, He is the exact image of God. You know, the, the Greek phrase there is the idea of a mold. Where you take something. So when I was a little kid, I played with Plato. Okay, I ate it, but, uh, but uh, it was salty. You know? But when I was a little kid, I played with Play-Doh, and I would, they had this thing called the, the Play-Doh Fun Factory, I think. had two handles that you'd close together, and you could get these different molds and put it into the little slot, and then you'd put the Play-Doh in the thing, and then you'd squeeze the handle down, and when you open it up, you had a much better snowman than you could make, right? Or you had like a really detailed Santa Claus or something. You know? That's the idea in the Greek. For he is the exact imprint of God. Okay, that, that he is the image of God made perfect. So God, the unchangeable, the mold never changes. But Jesus Christ took on a mutable nature, a changeable nature when he became human. Now the Godhead in him doesn't change. Same Godhead all the time. But the man Jesus Christ grew in wisdom and stature and stature in favor with God and man. So he took on changeability to be like us. And he took on the exact imprint of God. So that what the mold looked like, he looked like. We see God when we see Jesus. We see his father. Anyone who's seen me has seen the father. Now here's the thing. Every once in a while, if you took the Play-Doh and you stuck it into the mold and you closed it, maybe there'd be an air bubble just underneath the surface, right? And when you applied the pressure, the air bubble would pop so that when you open the mold, what would come out would be like Santa Claus, but it'd be missing half of Santa's face. That's what we're like. That's what we're like. In fact, when we are shaped by the world around us, we're more like the pre-molded lump. Shapeless, formless, evil, broken. And we forget that we also are sinners in need of salvation. And that we need Jesus not years ago, but today. I should say not only years ago. But today and every day. And our salvation is new every day. But what we need, folks, is something that doesn't change. Right and wrong, justice and truth. Get that definition from the world and you're going to have to ask for the date. What what time is it? If I want to know what's right and good to do, and I ask humanity, it depends. When are we talking about? Because as we pass through time, that will change out there. The Lord God does not change. So his morality is true yesterday, today, and forever, and it doesn't change. Hatred is never right and good. God, God's unchanging nature is almost difficult to get our heads around. How do you get angry? Think about that. You get angry because you're, I'm in a state of peace, right? And then I encounter a stimulus that I don't care for that makes me feel violated. And I go from peace to anger. And then after a while, I come back down. That's because I change over time. If God doesn't change, 
then his anger is from eternity and into eternity. It is because it is not because he was stimulated to become angry. It is because before time began, he committed to truth. Actually, he didn't have to commit. It's his nature. Truth and righteousness and goodness is who he is. And so when evil shows up, it encounters the anger of God that has always been there towards evil and always will be, at least as long as evil exists. When evil's done, that, that nature will still be in him, but the, we'll never encounter him as an angry God. His peace has been there from the beginning and into eternity. And, and his love never goes anywhere. He does not change. His opinion of you isn't different today than it was yesterday when you were doing bad stuff. Always the same. You are always his delight. And your sin always encounters his wrath. Always because he doesn't change. But see, you and I do. And what that means, we've been created to change. So we can. If you are not pleased with where you are, you need to come to the mold. Because he doesn't change and he will put his imprint upon you. His goodness is always there for you, always available. His anger is always a goad to encourage you to get out of the mess that you're in. His love is always there to encourage you to keep going and not give up because he hasn't and he won't. He can't because he can't change. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and into eternity. Which is very good news for creatures like us who are in a constant threat by what changes all the time around us. Well, we aren't really in danger when we rest within the mold. When he's making us into what we ought to be. When we walk with Jesus Christ and experience his shaping influence upon our souls, we are becoming more and more what we always were meant to be. We are being changed from one degree of glory into another. We are being changed by that which does not. So if you're unsatisfied with your righteousness, if you're unsatisfied with where you stand with God, if you're not pleased, know that he loves you. And provides you with a solid and unchanging foundation on which you can stand and on which you can walk as you make your way from unrighteousness to righteousness. He provides you even with what that even means. The Lord God calls to all of us who change. He says, I don't change. So you will not be consumed. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the way that you love us. We thank you for your steady and constant presence in our life and the blessing of being able to be with someone that we can count on and who never lets us down. God, we know that we, we fail, but by your strength, our failure is overcome and that we have a hope that we can succeed. God, we pray that you would send Jesus soon, that this world of changing might be behind us and we might be forever with you. Until that day comes, help us as we seek after holiness to follow Jesus well. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.